Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi. With me today is Liz Nolasco. Hooray. Hello. Hi, Liz. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Great. <laughs> Pretending we haven't already done like a half hour of chit chat. Um, maybe not that long. Uh, so Liz and I are going to talk today about um, uh, uh, the sort of hierarchies and levels and, and things, gatekeeping we do regarding the types of early childhood settings and childcare settings out there. Um, I think that's what we're talking about. Does that sound like a good summary? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right yeah. how we consider what's best for children as a society yeah. and as professionals and parents yeah. and just all of the different angles yeah so um so we're going to use the a quote from um Elliot Haspel's book um by the time this comes out he will have been on a couple of weeks ago um but the book is called crawling behind America's child care crisis and how to fix it and this comes from chapter two, where he talks about the chapter title is the many faces and brains of care of child care. Um, but here's what we're going to use for our starting point. Um, if you want, uh, sorry, if you want, if you want to impact what happens in, oh, no, never mind. I was reading entirely the wrong thing. Let me try this again. <laughs> two sentences start with the same thing, but this is the one we want. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you want to impact early childhood, you have to be everywhere at once with tentacles reaching into places as far flung as publicly funded school based pre K's and the sacred privacy of the home. The only viable option is to flip the question on its head, worry less about the form of care and more about the people providing the care and the families choosing what care is best for their child. So maybe we could have just done that second part because um, I don't want to sound like I'm endorsing publicly funded school-based pre-K um, because uh, uh, people who listen often know that that sort of sets my teeth on edge um, and scares me to think about. But it is true that we can't say there's only one kind of care and that's, or there's only one kind of early education that's that's really the best thing for children. Um, so if we're trying to solve this problem, that's the only option we can look at. Right. And I think that, well, I'm not exactly encouraged by the way VPK and other public preschool initiatives have come out. Mm -hmm. I think, I think there's still hope there. I think there's still optimism that we can push up some of the things that we know are important in early ed up into the school system. But also, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I would love to have that op optimism. I try to be. Um, I try to have the optimism, but my problem is that the people running those spaces already through no fault of their own, don't have any early childhood or child development knowledge or under their understanding is elementary school. And so anything in their building is going to have to look like what they think elementary school should be, right. you know what I mean? So that's mostly where my concern comes from is that, and the Dale Farron study that essentially said, right this isn't really the best way to do things but i do think maybe what you know what haspel's saying here i think is that there has to be elements of any kind of solution any kind of solution has to have elements of all types of 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 care out there yes. that's out there and for some families Absolutely. that's going to be some kind of universal pre-k kind of solution right and on one hand i think that the phrase parental choice is very politically loaded right now yes. and often not in ways that I right. agree with. Yes. Um, and at the same time, you know, we are talking about your family and your children and your values is really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. And if that means that your family needs support because you believe that there should be a family member staying home with your child, how can we support that family? How can we support the person staying home with that child to understand child development, you know, mm -hmm. how can we support everybody who is caring for and educating children in what children need? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, later, and this is one of the other quotes we talked about using, but later on the same page, he says, um, the fact is that children can learn anywhere that there is a responsive, loving ad adult and something to pique their interest. Um, uh, you know, I would, of course, go a little further and say, maybe we want a little bit of child development expertise in there right. too um but but 
thinking about it in those ways. Like if we just have things that pique children's interest and allow them to follow that interest and there's a, a healthy uh, sort of connected relationship uh, with the adults right. in the space, the setting doesn't matter as much. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's huge. I think way off mic, there's been kind of an ongoing conversation about what children need in their environments and what an ideal uh -huh. environment should look like and who set all these expectations for indoor space and outdoor space and all the different measurements. And, yeah. you know, I keep oscillating between, well, yes, of course, this is optimal for children. And okay, well, we can't always have the optimal. How can we, yeah. <laughs> you know, children are in lots of environments and how do we just adapt as needed and adapt the environment rather than forcing the children in that environment to comply yeah. in some way that is unnatural and harmful to them. Yeah. I, you know, it's like, so in so many other contexts, um, what's really important isn't as easy to measure as some of these right. other, these other things. And so that's why <clears throat> one of the reasons it's so easy for early childhood folks to get hooked into those early academics or those discrete academic skills as their focus, because it's easier to measure than relationship and mental well-being and joy. Right. <laughs> um, uh, but the same, you know, uh, I think the episode, by the time this conversation comes out, this will be further in the past, but Mike Huber on his Teaching with the Body and Mind podcast, they just did an episode um, about equipment versus environments I think is the name of it but but what Mike yes. basically said in the opening is you know you look at a quality checklist and it's all about how many things you have on shelves and what's on display in the room and what your setting looks like um, and that's where we get this push that only child care centers can be you know approved places for care or only head start is really early you know quality education for young children and we get into that gatekeeping um instead right. of thinking about relationships and being developmentally responsive to what's happening with children um and I'm guilty of it you know I've definitely had different parts of my career different parts of my own uh uh professional tra trajectory I guess where I thought centers were better than homes and um, sometimes there's sure. part of me where I think a family child care home really is so much better than a child care center um, and um, you know I've been I've had times where I'm like no we can't just leave them home with parents because some parents are really bad parents <laughs> or you know they're mean or they're abusive or whatever so they can't just be home there um, right. but that's I mean that's sort of just the the other side of this coin is that nothing is perfect all the time and yeah so we and have to have we, lots of options right and how can we work on the adults in all of those settings how yeah. can we you know rather than turning up our nose that oh well that's daycare but when he's four he'll go to preschool yeah and you know or the kids who are home with their parents and the parents are freaking out because they're like oh he's about to start kindergarten and he's never been outside like mm -hmm. he has no school I've been drilling his letter since he was two and he can almost write that <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah how can we help share developmentally appropriate practices and child development and just the heart of what children need with all of these different mm -hmm. people and also you know on the, the the other side of the coin right the parents who don't place that heavy importance on literacy but also really just see the child as a burden only see uh -huh. you know they don't see their influence right they just see this burden this obligation this this is what we do. And now there's a person that I'm responsible for and I keep them fed and dry and clean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But there are a lot of quiet. people who, who, who are working in formal care and education settings who have a very similar attitude about the children. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All of it, I suppose. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, how do we get the adults around? How do, how do we bring them around or support them if they're already kind of there? Um, how do we change the conversation from uh, that sort of return on investment? You know, we have to pack all this academics in now so they don't go to prison in 12 years. Um, right. That, that whole narrative, how do we, how do we change that to essentially Carol Gobert, Gar Garbod and Murray, I can never say her name right the first time, uh, running the world. Like how do we, how do we make right, this yes. shift? <laughs> right. I mean, continuing her mission that care is not a bad word and mm -hmm. you know <laughs> mm -hmm. it is in fact crucial even up through the elementary school year 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, so I, I've gotten to be in the last uh, several months, pretty involved in local community, like committees and efforts and, and uh, panel discussions about the child care problems specific to Tippecanoe County here in Indiana. And I'm sure the conversations are very similar because the problem is similar. Um, employers concerned that they don't have um, employees and, and thinking that a lack of good child care is part of that problem. So we need to open up uh, a giant warehouse where all these children can go and then our employment problems will be solved. Or the other side of it, people saying, well, we just need whatever solution works for the parents. And then someone at the table will inevitably lean forward and say, but it has to be high quality with no further discussion of what high quality means. Like, I think we just put up all right. these, um, all these barriers to solving the problem. Uh, you know, I, and I, I do. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, there's, there's kind of a historical precedent for the warehouse model, honestly. I yeah. mean, in, in a good way, right? The um, the shipyards up in Northern California here, yeah. when uh, during World War II, they yeah. set up these incredible childcare facilities. They would help the families. They would provide meals. You know, it right. was caring for the whole family in service of caring for the children in service of, yeah, keeping the adults at work who wanted yeah. and needed to be at work. Yeah. Um, and you know, there were no quality checklists yet at that point, but by all measures. Right. But it know, still became very learning political. and active and involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the, the reason that didn't continue, part of it was, you know, the men came home from war. And so right. women had to go back to their rightful place of being um, just in, in the home um, or in the home. I don't want to say just uh, and not needing that care as much. But also if you read about that, um, not that, but then what, what, what was suggested when Nixon was president, then that really built right. on what had happened in world war II, um, with the shipyard, uh, programs, um, the, the narrative became, oh, oh, the government's coming in to take over your family and you're not going to have any choices anymore. And, um, your values are going to be trampled on. We can't have we can't have a, a unified system of childcare because mom should be at home anyway. You know, all these, these narratives right. that we feel like we've really moved past. But if you really look at some of the current conversations and policies and political conversations about it, it's still very much and on the, the same. Level too, <laughs> on the micro level too. I mean, it's really yeah. infiltrated everybody's brains. There are so many, you know, if you look at any new parent message boards, there are all these moms who are just engulfed in guilt for going back mm -hmm. to work when you know and they'll say like I love my job I love what I do and I love my kid and also like I'm happier when I work and then yeah. go home and see my kid right. you know yeah. um but also there's this messaging that child care is bad and god forbid you call it daycare or yeah or a babysitter or whatever else yeah and that's um you know that's just suboptimal for whatever reasons are built up yeah I I still really struggle with the daycare thing like ultimately I feel like I don't care like call it what you want to call it as long as we're being intentional and thoughtful and and developmentally informed and responsive or whatever mm -hmm. but I still have that inward button that button that gets pushed when I hear the word and I'm like oh don't say that but it doesn't it doesn't matter that's not a helpful part of the conversation right <laughs> um I, th I think what's interesting uh, so I'm in California and to care for children period requires, um, in any kind of, in a center, uh -huh. I don't actually know the home-based regulations, but in a center uh -huh. to be considered a teacher of young children, you need four college classes in early childhood education, like four specific classes. Oh, okay. And, um, but that doesn't matter if you're in a daycare or after school. Sorry, if you're just listening, there are lots of air quotes going yeah, on. Or just preschool. imagine air quotes flying everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, you know, it doesn't matter the setting, but if it's called a, whether it's called a daycare, whether it's called a preschool, if there's a person who can be alone with your children, they have this same baseline level of education. Oh, okay. And there are still people who are like, well, I'm going to move them from daycare to preschool because preschool has the word preschool in it. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, or worse, the doing preschool. Oh, we have two hours a day of preschool every day in our daycare. I yeah. love it. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, sure. where preschool is just code for prepared, generally adult led activities rather 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) letting the children follow their interests independently. Right. Uh, you know what? Just the whole school readiness things ruins everything. (laughs) Um, Because that's, I think we can connect a lot of this to, or uh, I think a lot of of this narrative that, uh, you know, a center or some sort of institutional setting is better Mm -hmm. than a home, home home-like setting or a home. Um, Part of it, I think, comes from the idea that we have to be doing something to get them ready for school. But I think part of it also comes from that feeling that as a woman, if I'm going to choose to work and let someone else care for my child, I have to, and and this is subconscious. I don't think anyone's, you know, maybe specifically thinking this way, explicitly thinking this way, but if I'm going to make this decision, I have to justify it in some way. Uh, And, and that sort of learning and, and academic competition and and race uh, is an easy justification. Right. And I do think that actually contributes to some of the tension between families and their yeah. care providers as well, because yeah. when there's that parental resentment of, I have to work outside the home, sure. it's easy to find all the little mistakes that someone else, or, you know, not even mistakes, all the differences between the sure. way this person cares for your child and the way you care for your child. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It's and a system where nobody's really happy with anybody else. Yeah. And I, you know, I want to be really clear. That's not a criticism of working of moms who work outside the home. I mean, I, no, no. I definitely, I always have, my children have been in childcare. We're in childcare, you know, from the time they were a couple months old, it made me a better mom because I was a better, more fulfilled person. Um, uh, but that's me. That's not right. You know, some people, I know that there are some uh, parents out there who really would rather be at home that can't uh, for economic reasons. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you're right. I think that does lead to a lot of um, te- tension. I mean, it's just what you said, that tension is there then. Right. And certainly not always, right. This, but there are certainly yeah. situations. Right. Right. We just have to keep it. <laughs> Let's just assume that there is a, um, this isn't true for everybody <laughs> under right, current, right, yeah. running through this whole conversation. Um, yeah. but, but that's the thing, right. If we're talking about what's best for families, what's best for children, what's best for children is what fulfills their parents, uh-huh. right. That's what yes. all of the research on children being in care from a young age says, if the parents are happier working, then it's much better for the children to be in care. If the parents mm-hmm. are actually miserable and want to be home with their children, and like you said, you know, just yeah. doing it because they can't make ends meet otherwise, then yeah. they're generally less happy, and children generally don't have as good of an experience and don't receive the same benefits. And it mm-hmm. just comes down to supporting the parents, supporting the adults who we don't think about when we think about the children, right? We separate yeah. them. Yeah, for sure. But keeping that, you know, just we all need care, right? <laughs> all yeah. the way up through. If the parents are taken care of, if the parents are fulfilled, if the parents had the opportunity to get their needs met, then lo and behold, they find it a lot easier to care for and meet the needs of their children. Yeah, right. Um, uh, so you, I think, am I imagining this? You wanted to talk too about then how that how this affects like teacher prep and early childhood yeah qualifications and stuff (laughs) yeah so I kind of touched on it for a second I was like oh I should go back to that with that the 12 unit thing um but I I think it's it's kind of appealing to me your 12 12 credit hour depending on what's being taught in those but anyway right yeah that's the thing it's very school dependent but also it's yeah yeah, it's functionally a CDA the 12 units are basically the same thing um yeah but if you're looking at the qualifications of the people who are caring for children, if you're looking at how to get the best care for children, I do think there is a significant element of understanding theory, understanding developmentally mm-hmm. appropriate practice, understanding, and the apprenticeship model, right? Exchange has been yeah. sending out a lot of articles recently, and you and Tiffany have been talking forever about yeah, the yeah. apprenticeship model and how valuable it is. And I think that's kind of how I got into the field, right? I got into the field when I was just starting classes. So I was taking my classes and working full time at the same time. And I got so much more out of it than I think mm-hmm. I would have if it had just been, you know, purely the classes and then in the classroom. Right. Or, you know, I think the other difficulty is, and, you know, I, I worked 
for 20 years before I got any kind of degree. I worked in early childhood. I worked in child care centers, um, did family child care in my home for a year uh, before I went back to school and got a formal. I had a CDA, but before I went back and got my degrees and stuff. Um, and I feel like I resisted it for a long time because I'm already doing the work. I'm doing it really well. Families love me. Children are happy, you know, whatever. But um, uh, that's because I'll just go ahead and say that's because I was always curious and I was learning and I, you know, I wasn't just saying, mm -hmm. oh, anyone can do this work. I still was seeking out information about how children grow, learn, develop, um, what they, what they need developmentally at different stages. Um, and then when I went to college in my, at 40, it kind of fit in there. And so many of the students that I see are already doing the work are in that same situation, but, um, not all of them are curious, not all, some of them still are like, I don't understand why I have to do these classes. I already do the work. Um, and there's a lot of unlearning that then has to happen. So I feel like people who, who teach teachers have a level of responsibility to kind of be able to guide the unlearning and add to the, <laughs> right. add, add to the, add the new skills and the new information and um, help teachers think critically about what they're already doing that fits what we're learning about and what, um, what maybe they could, could change or think differently about. It's hard work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Being able yeah. to pinpoint, oh yes, this is wonderful. This is exactly what we were talking about yeah. last week. Yeah. And also, hey, this thing is another thing we were talking about last week and it's still, there's something that's didn't yeah. get across somehow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, it's just a messy system all around, but I think it starts with adults working with children in whatever setting, even if you're a parent, understanding that just because, especially just because we're women, doesn't mean we're born knowing how to do everything or understanding what, what is really happening in front of us. We can have a good instinct for it. We can, you know, but, um, but, but the adults need to sort of recognize there's more that I could know that would help me right. support this and child. I think the other piece of that is there are some things that I was raised with that I think served me that didn't. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, that uh -huh. I think there's so much of, well, yeah, I was punished when I did something right. wrong and yes. therefore and I'm I learned fine. how I'm a good person. Therefore yeah. <laughs> I learned how to, you know, so listening to what the child is communicating through behavior rather than just punishing the behavior and stopping there. Uh -huh. Well, they stopped, you know, that's what I needed. That's yeah. right. Even if that's not what they needed, but it's what they got. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Although most of the time they don't really stop. Like when I'm, when I'm talking to, wow. to teachers who rely on punishment kinds of mentalities mm -hmm. and practices, it's the same kid over and over again. So what's yeah. happening is not really working, but then we just shift the blame onto the child or the family instead of thinking, oh, it's our, it's our response. That's not effective here. It's like, <laughs> oh course. no, there's something persistently wrong about that this child and, and right. this family and that's why my methods aren't aren't getting the change I want that's a whole other right. podcast that's true um, yeah I guess we can't but go yeah there but quite it's yet. it's hard to because you know this is what I end up hearing a lot is people who are resistant to kind of new ways of thinking because if they accept that there's something they could do differently that means I was doing it wrong. And you're telling me I've been harming children all this time. And so that's hard for them to get through. And that's not, you know, not necessarily sometimes. Yeah, you were harming children, but, but uh, now you have a choice. I mean, sometimes it's just, uh, right. uh, maybe it wasn't the most effective way or the, the most developmentally sound way to respond but there wasn't necessarily malice behind it or you, you're not a bad person because you, you didn't know differently. You know what I mean? I'm it's trying funny, to say it without saying that quote, you know? Yeah, no, it's funny. Cause I was thinking about this the other day. Cause I was going back through, I just 
got a website, got all fancy, reposted some old blog posts, oh, wrote new blogs. Nice. And I was going through it and I was like, huh, this is just like a chronicle of all the times I fucked up what I learned from it. And also, <laughs> do I want this out here? But also like, yes, maybe it's a good thing for people yeah. to see like, hey, this is actually, you know, later I'm thinking about this. And, you know, often yeah. I had the chance to repair it with the child or at least over time yeah. our relationship grew past it. Right. Yeah. But just trying to figure out and be open and public about like, we're all constantly learning right. and by and large, you know, the mistakes that we've made, especially if we can correct them, especially if we can correct them with that child who's, who has been generally mildly harmed or at least not helped by our mistakes. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. The relationship piece, that love for the child, that understanding and time with them can overcome a whole lot of little things. Yeah. Like that I was just writing about when I was like, on a kid for taking too many paper towels. And then I took a step back of like, wait a minute, am I really going to lose my mind over too many paper towels? <laughs> is this, yeah. is this worth damaging the relationship with the child right now? Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Um. Oh, I just had a spark of something and now it's gone. But nope, I mean, it's, it's really it's, gone. I can keep talking because. Yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, we, there's a big dialogue about the phrase children are resilient meaning oh Oh. we can just keep harming them and they'll be fine versus like what I feel is maybe the actual meaning children in relationship with supportive and warm adults Mm -hmm. can get through a lot of stuff even when those very same supportive and warm adults mess up sometimes right right (laughs) it's not a system that lives inside them that no matter what happens to me I'll be fine because I'm resilient um and it's used in that way so adults don't have to feel bad (laughs) (laughs) about some of the decisions that are being made but yeah it's it's you know like so much of everything it's it's within relationship and within a system that's paying attention and prioritizing health and well-being physical emotional mental um right and if we have the teachers who are educated holistically on children's well-being and supporting their learning and supporting their acquisition and yeah um Oh no, I lost the word. <gasps> the way they file oh, the information. Terrible. Classification? The... Nope. What is it? Mm, I don't know what you're trying friends. to say, but uh-huh. I'll text you later. I'm sure it'll come back to me. Uh, <laughs> it involves yeah. schemas. It's how they it's an A word. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Accommodation, accommodation. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> Got how it. they assimilate and accommodate the new information that's coming yeah. in. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And just understanding that the children are an active participant, right? Because I feel like there's a lot of lip service paid to it, but I still hear children are sponges rather than, Mm -hmm. nope, children are systems grabbing what they see and working with that information and changing their brains physically with the information that they receive and what they, how they can manipulate it themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a weird, um, uh, sort of balance. Cause I get that that sponge thing, sometimes means you know they're just curious and they're active and they're exploring and they want to learn but too often it means well they're an empty thing that I can fill with what I choose (laughs) right (laughs) um I just you know oh go ahead no I was just saying I do think the sponge is kind of worthwhile to keep in mind just in terms of the behaviors that we are engaging in that we don't necessarily want to pass along right? oh sure because yeah. we're not, when we're not act- I, I feel like the sponge metaphor is actually more apt when we're not purposefully teaching things I feel like that's much oh. better when we're like accidentally you know we're using language or like yeah um, my other thing I've been reading a lot about recently is just our societal and individual relationships with food and body image right mm-hmm. and so those things that were you know when it kid sees us looking in the mirror too long and making faces and you know standing sideways and sucking our gut whatever (laughs) that's kind of where the sponge model comes in right in my mind a little bit more than right when I'm you know teaching in the classroom (laughs) Mm -hmm. for sure um no that makes a lot of sense and there's so much that happens I mean even if we think about language acquisition it is sort of a sponge-ish kind of model um that starts with their brain architecture, of course, and their physical development as that impacts the, the brain, but, um, but even then they need the opportunity to express it. And, you know, it's, there's a high amount of 
feedback that's required for that. It's not just the passive. It's why you can't sit a six month old in front of a TV in a different language and suddenly, and they become fluent in that language. They don't have that exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So again, not a perfect model, (laughs) not an absolute it is or it isn't. Um, But it's an interesting way to think about it, about things. Um, So, you know, I'm just going back to, to teaching adults. You know, I think about when I did go to college, so much of it until I got into my master's program, then we had one class that was specifically about play. Um, uh, it was still pretty adult mediated play, but it was at least a whole class about play. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't learn much about play and care and Um, when the conversation was about relationships, it was about how you can use a relationship to manage behavior, essentially. Um, uh, and I think now, you know, every class I teach has 12 or 13 objectives that someone else has decided that I, I can teach it however I want, but I have to get all those objectives in. And it's really challenging to, you know, essentially you have to sneak in some stuff that's developmentally appropriate that needs to be in there. And you have to sneak in stuff about just the care pieces. You know, it's, it's not all, I'm not teaching, I'm not giving you a degree for the nine to 11 time that we've decided is our learning time. When you come through these classes, I want you to think about everything we talk about and the whole child and the whole day and the family, you know, it's, it's difficult within some of the systemic structures that we've got set up to even teach, um, our, our current and future early educators and childcare providers and whatever you want to call them mm-hmm. because of the system, the system and it's capital S <laughs> <laughs> and it's so unfortunate because there, there are just so many I mean, if we're looking at um, the the impact, right, mm-hmm. of education as a whole, like why do we have public education? Why do we have early childhood programs? Why does it exist? Ideally, it's, you know, especially as you're looking at later grades, but I think it starts from the beginning. It's for a functioning, informed, caring citizenry. Mm-hmm. You know, it's to build a society of people who can take care of each other and support each other mm. but when we're looking sounds at sounds pretty socialist metrics... liz i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i agree with you yes we should be thinking about it in that way but then it it just becomes this um you know i had i love my graduate program i don't want to speak poorly of my graduate program yeah. however <laughs> i was not yeah. allowed to acknowledge zero to three-year-olds as part of my um my capstone project oh wow like, the, like nobody was and uh-huh. the, the explanation was, well, of course, I mean, of, of course, social and emotional development are crucial in zero to three. So why do we even need to talk about it? Oh, my word. Because nobody's wow. doing it in zero to three. <laughs> no, there aren't enough people who are paying attention to it in zero to three. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Yeah. I mean, that's the other piece where what how we educate doesn't really fit what we know about young children. Um, like uh, in my program, um, the only specific infant toddler classes are electives. Nobody has to take a class that's specifically about infant toddler. And so I have to make sure that every class I teach includes birth, uh, infants and toddlers, I guess. And I get sort of criticized because I, um, I then end up sort of neglecting the six to eight year old part of early childhood. That's hard. Yeah. But what I know about the students coming through the program is that not many of them are going to work with that age or are already working, but a lot of them think they're going to go get a preschool job, but that's not where the openings are in the center you're interviewing for. And so you're going to get stuck in an infant toddler room. Um, And so you better, I want everybody to know, but the reality is that that is such an important part of development. So much happens that's important to the child from birth to three right. that we again end up ignoring because we're so focused on this one model of what early education looks like right and it's sold to us and pushed into all new parents and buying mm-hmm. the black and white books and watching mm-hmm. the sensory videos on the youtube and, yeah the sensory <laughs> you videos. know yeah. our, our vision of what should be what it looks like versus yeah. what it is because somebody can make money off of what yep. they think parents think it looks like yep yep 
right. So what are we going to do about it? <laughs> mm, confiscate all the toys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I was just on it. This is maybe related, but I was just on somebody's Facebook page where I think it was probably the occupational therapist. Cause that's um, what I'm reading a lot now. Um, but someone in the comments said, how do you know when, uh, the, the child is too old for the toy or, or something like that? How do you know when, when to get rid of toy, certain toys, something like that. And, um, I have an answer like, in mind, but I'm very curious how other people answered that. Yeah. Question. Well, you know, I, what Kelsey said was if the child still uses it, then yeah, <laughs> not, it's not too young for them. But a therapist had been telling this, this woman who was asking some, some therapist she was working with her child had been saying, you need to get rid of these because they're not challenging enough and they're holding them back developmentally, you know, that kind of oh, idea. I that. Yes. Uh, but I yeah. think there's an element of that too, as we're talking about um, gatekeeping about what real early childhood education should look like and what's quality it goes back to that um what kind of toys are on the shelf if we move away right. from you're right if we if we move away from toys we we respond i think differently with the child the child certainly responds differently and i think too i, I keep going back and forth because i do find a really ugly elitist view of certain types of toys right the wooden toys the Waldorf yes. toys the Montessori toys that yeah. Maria nor Steiner would have ever laid eyes on <laughs> um, <laughs> yep but you know th there's this idea of you know all toys are bad versus the way we adults make children interact with a lot of toys is bad and yeah there are lots of bad toys out there that yeah. exist yeah but yeah. I, I don't think we can do other quite episode, the same but... broad brush yeah right right um but just that idea that you can walk into a classroom and look around and decide whether it's quality or not based on right what's out there. I just had someone who was in, um, she works for a Head Start somewhere um, and they were doing their pre-service and this teacher really wanted to put more natural loose parts kind of things in the classroom. And they said, no, it has to be from the catalog. It can only be stuff from the you know, whatever catalog they were using. And they, they were emailing me asking, how do I fight this? Like, give me some information to oh, use wow. to fight this. And I was like, oh boy. Um, Google's nice. <laughs> Google can help <laughs> you with that. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I tried to answer a little bit, but um, you know, we just, we just really get stuck in our scripts, I guess is what I'll, what I'll mm -hmm. say. And uh, we all, myself included, um, uh, you know, I'm less likely to read something that I think is going to disagree with the way I already think about something. That's how we're wired. Um, sure. Uh, That's how you people with low, but low blood pressure are wired. I read everything and just get enraged. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I've done my fair share of rage highlighting. Also, as you know, a parent <laughs> from the Purdue preschool gave me a highlighter that she had labeled rage highlighter. Uh, no. <laughs> with a label maker that's kind of fun and actually as I'm trying to write now I have this like I have so much rage highlighting karma out there <laughs> I can't ever let someone read something I wrote now um anyway one of the fun games I play with myself when I should be writing and I'm not um but that's neither here nor there and I don't remember but... where we were going when I started that mm -hmm. But if we're talking about <laughs> yeah. self-initiated and the kind of people that we want to grow, mm -hmm. grow to be and grow and, you know, support in their growth, I, I think it's all necessary, right? I think yeah. looking critically at our practice, looking critically at our writing that we're putting out into the world that, yeah. you know, hundreds of millions of people will read. And once it's a New York Times bestseller, you've got to be really confident <laughs> that your book is going to be the right thing for children yeah. and yeah. not another way to stress parents yeah. out. Yeah, that's <laughs> not one of my goals. <laughs> the we'll new york it. times anyway um <laughs> yeah so i don't yeah i guess we can end it with saying we don't know what the solution is other than we have to challenge ourselves um think critically about the narratives that are out there when we when we get like when i get that button pushed about the word daycare what does that mean about you know what do i need to dig deeper about with my own knowledge and beliefs and right and also once we've done 
the work with ourselves, we can have those conversations with other people about yeah. their ideas of equality and their ideas of care and early education and their vision long term rather yeah. than what can this child do when they leave preschool and start kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I don't know how I have no idea how long we've been recording, but we also talked before we hit record about, uh, you know, just briefly in passing, we were going to talk about it. We just mentioned Biden's uh, Build Back Better plan oh, yeah. that didn't really get us where we hoped it would get us. And, um, but even there we saw, I think it was the closest thing we've gotten in a long time to seeing a workable kind of, kind of right. plan. But even that plan was, um, the value was on the institutions that look more like school. Um, those and kinds just the of word education and, and the, the word very education. narrow definition of education that we've all carried. Because yeah, yeah. Our memories start in that very formalized academic education. Right, right. And you know, um, uh, I remember a couple of times that the president would be talking about it, and he'd say school, not daycare. And I was like, someone on his <laughs> team needs to get to him. Someone needs to talk about the difference that he thinks he sees there and um, why right. he feels like he needs to emphasize that so much. Um, and why there's this idea that people, regardless of age, can only learn what's pushed down their throats and not what they're interested in. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a weird, I don't know. It's a weird, it's just weird to me when I think about how much easier all of our jobs would be if we spent less time trying to stop children from doing the things that are natural for children um, or how we think we need to teach curiosity when all the things around us that sort of bug us about young children are because of their, you know, they are curious. The curiosity is already right. there. We just want to corral it into an appropriate thing to be curious about. Um, be curious about bugs. Now it's April. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's August. I hope you're all ready to be curious about each other because here comes the right. all about me and all my friends uh, themes. Yeah. Um, oh boy. Okay. We probably should, should wrap it, wrap it up. I feel myself just sort of spiraling to top from topic to topic and not, not really, uh, doing an interesting podcast. <laughs> probably have a, a final conclusion of thinking is good. Thinking is good. That's where Allowing we'll end it. to think is even better. Even better. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You should think they should think it should just be sometimes you'll have thoughts that are wrong and that's okay <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly and go watch bluey um <laughs> maybe i can get bluey to sponsor the show anyway thank you liz this was fun finally to sit down and uh yeah. and record after we'd talked about and planned and even started one that we had to finish <laughs> early yes. yeah um and thanks everybody for listening to another episode of that early childhood nerd